So um, I was invited to talk a little bit about how we look at our company at uh, platform-driven development. And actually, it's just really interesting hearing uh, Kim speak on a couple of these panels about the systems she's put in place to accelerate her delivery. And they sound very platform-like to me. So uh, just quickly, uh, I'm Sebastian. I'm the co-founder of a company called Xperia. We've been an OpenFin partner for a number of years. I'm the uh, CEO and chief hockey practice driver. I really related to that remark. Um, <laughs> I'm here with Tim uh, Baker. He's the head of our financial services practice. If you want to see a demo or talk to uh, anyone about what we do, uh, uh, he's out there. Long experience in market data, capital markets, and such. So the obligatory one minute about w what we are and why we're interesting. Uh, we're a company that helps other companies like yourselves build software solutions, so custom software development. But our niche is very much focused on analytics heavy, visualization heavy software for experts. So we work in a number of industries where expert users are doing mission critical work, the, the biggest of which is finance, which is why we're excited to be an OpenFin partner and do work like this here in finance, both with OpenFin uh, type engagements and outside of that, we've worked around wealth desktop user experience design and implementation and integrations. We've worked in capital markets to do buy side portfolio management type systems, trading systems. We've worked across compliance and risk to help uh, fight bad guys, basically. Uh, and we're working in a lot of interesting places. And over the years that we've been doing that, which is over 20 years, uh, we just noticed the same patterns over and over again in these kind of applications we build, expert driven. Experts are weird. They're difficult, right? You guys have met traders before, right? Doctors, right? They're very specific. Um, and so we have, over time, built a collection of technologies and practices that we think of as, as our platform that help us deliver. So. What does this mean? Why, why, why do we care about a platform? I just thought I'd motivate with a humorous cartoon. How many of you guys have been in charge of a solution design, a large part of which is software, and said to your team, we have this much money, and we got to do the alpha stuff, like uh, Kim talked about. Let's do the most important things. Please husband my resources very carefully. And about two months later, you discover they've been fooling around with something that's just completely irrelevant to actually delivering your business value. Like, it matters. You have to get it right. But just, oh my gosh, you've been spending three months doing what? Or the, the canonical, I'm using web tech, so first I'm going to wait uh, waste two months arguing about whether I should use React or Angular. Uh, yes, we have an opinion. I do think one's better than the other. But at the end of the day, are we going to get that trading system built faster or not? Or did you guys all just feel good and smart arguing about this? Getting platforms in place and sticking to them helps you avoid a, a lot of this nonsense and why we really push it for the work that we do. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the platform that we've stitched together, but I think each of us stitches those together uh, in our work. And to me, it's all about time to market. Ain't nobody got time to waste money anymore. I don't know if they ever did, but they definitely don't now. So wh wh what are some platforms that we all see and use? I mean, I don't know. One of them's sponsoring uh, our event tonight, AWS, like the platform to rule all platforms. When you choose a programming language, you know, Python or .NET or whatever, you're implicitly buying into a whole set of ecosystem and pieces there, right? Uh, I don't know, Databricks, analytics type stuff. Chromium, very relevant to this conversation. Um, there's a pretty interesting platform we're all here to learn about called OpenFin. I thought Gavin's uh, introduction uh, uh, today was really interesting about if these are a set of capabilities that are important to the type of technology you're delivering, then isn't this nice that they're all supplied here? Um, and, and we deliver a lot of solutions on top of them. There's other things that aren't like obviously a piece of technology too, like how many people here have or have adopted or are building a design system? Right, a design system is a collection of pieces and components so that when it's time to build a new project, you can just go build a new project. There's a, a quote from one of our uh, hedge fund clients. He said, it was really great when I engaged you because within a week I had good ideas and criticisms of my bad ideas and real engagement with the user instead of a bunch of people asking me what kind of tree I would be if I was a tree. Just to make fun of designers a little bit. We, we love them. Um, or, you know, you spend four months designing stuff without actually getting to the heart of it. So at, at our company, we've put together a platform we call Connected, because all of our work is always about connecting interesting data and connecting users to insights about it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pieces that we have. And of course, I think they're interesting. And if you're building solutions like, like we build, we think we can get you to market faster with it. But I also just encourage you to think about what are the pieces you're collecting in your platform uh, as you build. So. What are some of the design, the design like, challenges in these applications we see year after year? Federated data, I heard that one discussed earlier. 
Um, there's no consistency between applications. There's a lot of them to deal with. Uh, there's a huge cognitive load, right? It's already enough that I'm an expert, whatever I am, liquidity analyst or, or AML investigator, but now I have to learn 50 different applications. Uh, and usually a lot of the value is driven from complex analytics that have to drive the experience. So I'm going to go through a couple of ways that, that we address this, and it's just striking how common they are across all these different industries. So one of the base things that we include, connected data is what we call it, is the ability to very quickly onboard different data sets and let you join them up together. Because there's not a single application in the world that really gets implemented in real life that just works off of you know, one kid's API. Um, you want to be able to bring all this data together into one place to power your experience. At the same time, and I thought some of the conversation uh, Gavin started today was really, the, the demos he showed were very uh, instructive here. You need to orchestrate that experience across a lot of different things. This is another quote from my current fave Rave, the uh, head of product for this hedge fund, where he says, you know, it's, it's really great that I have an OMS, but I don't like bullying my OMS vendor into including all my, you know, market data into it. That's a pain. When is he going to get around to that? And it's good that I have this research system, but how am I going to get my trade tickets into that? I want to have control over my analytics experience, my user experience in, in my playground and bring it and bring it there. So, you know, what, what we do with our customers is bring a toolkit to bear that will very quickly allow those common contexts to be built. This is an equity screener demonstration that I think we're showing out there. Ships with some of the open fin stuff where I can start with a common watch list that's over there. And as I work around and look at different equities, I can see news. And I can stitch together data in a screener here, maybe real-time pricing from one vendor, maybe um, dividend forecasts from another vendor, and holdings information from my Finborn Ibor. Uh, combine it you know, in, an in an analytics view, and also look at current news, right? I can go stitch this together in a day so that now I can get to the hard part, like maybe including my options calculator or my cool AI trading tickets or whatever it is. Um, I also want to be able to compose them very quickly. So, you know, over recent uh, months, we've been working with a number of partners to bring data delivery products uh, to, to life, uh, either as ours or white labeled as theirs, where we can then say, okay, this upper left example, that's, you know, FX forwards information. Let's, let's put together an FX ticket, chart, forwards, hedge calculator put this together in about a day after connecting to their data. Uh, that just left us the time to put together, you know, basically the custom chart and the calculator. That was the interesting bit. All this other stuff was window dressing and context, similar with the mutual fund screener below. The more you work, the more you can keep reusing all these same components, whether you've built them or someone else has built them. Um, and, and finally, uh, a lot of what is driving value is actually complex analytics, right? So a lot of what we do at these clients that you saw is we don't write our own analytics engines, but we connect to a lot of them in order to enable things like running analytics on the whole Venmo payment you know, network for a major bank to go find bad guys. Um, it turns out it's rare to, to f actually find money laundering. It takes you forever to go find it because there's billions and billions of records. But uh, you have to be known to look for it, and you have to find them occasionally. So a lot, a lot of work goes into it. Um, and it wouldn't be a, a useful conversation if I didn't talk a little bit about AI, but we're looking very deeply at how generative AI fits into these kind of workflows that we're describing here, expert-driven, analytics-focused. I mean, right now the attitude for everyone is, uh, we should try it. And actually, our head of product, when, when I challenged him to say, why is using this going to make our customers any uh, happier, said, who cares? It's the new iPhone. You don't all know exactly what that iPhone's going to do, but it's going to do something. And if you're not on it, figuring it out, like, forget it. We, we all have to go investigate this modality. There's really no choice we have. So I, I joke about it here, but I think it's true. Um, you know, so this is a list of use cases we're working with one of our clients. Uh, graded by some things that, that we've been thinking about, and you guys have probably been thinking about this in your domain, which is how do these large language models actually help us? If you guys have tried to use ChatGPT, for instance, seriously in your work, you've probably internalized a number of these things already. That's the great thing about uh, such a simple interface. But we already know there's some things that it can do really well and some things that it's very dangerous to trust it at. I heard an example today, like someone trying to get a chronologically sorted list of things. And no matter how many times they abuse that poor language model, it just wouldn't do it, right? There's just some things it can't do. So what we see is that it's still very surprising. This is from a really great paper called The, the Jagged Frontier. I encourage you to go read it, about how 
it's hard to know when a job is inside the competency envelope of a large language model and when it's outside. And that's a, a, a big part of uh, our own training as we learn how to use these things. Uh, but this is also from uh, the same paper, Boston Consulting Group gave all of their keen whiz-bang young analysts the same job to do, some with AI and some without AI, and found pretty strong quantitative evidence that it made a lot of the mediocre to upper skill folks move right into line with performance with experts. And so there's huge motivation to go implement this thing because all of a sudden now almost everyone can, can compete at a higher level. But the problem was a lot of those guys that largely moved up into the upper tier of performance didn't know when they had messed up. And so there would be big tasks that they were given where they would confidently say, oh, you know, my conclusion is this. And it was total nonsense because they didn't realize it. So we're, we're probably all aware of this, but the way we want to look at this is how does that technology help us create these compelling analytics-driven user experiences? So we look at the kind of questions people think they want to ask. I want to ask ChatGPT, what's my biggest position? It's going to say, well, I don't know, I think it's Apple, because it's everybody's biggest position. That's the predictive, obvious thing. But it's actually really bad at that kind of question, right? And you can kind of read ahead to a lot of these. I think a lot of the kinds of expert-driven questions we want to ask are actually really difficult for it to provide useful information for. And some of the things that it's easiest or best at doing are going to, they're just going to magically be bundled with every piece of data you buy. You don't think there's going to be an AI-generated summary for every data set that you've purchased? That's, that's already going to happen. So how do we integrate it into our workflows? The, the research we've been doing uh, with some of our design partners uh, you know, has pushed us down a much more deliberate road, which is let's understand that cool, unstructured intent from a user, but then drive it through a carefully constructed understanding of what context they're in. Right? What's my largest holding? Well. If you've got a screen full of stuff, context focused on your holdings on this ETF, you probably mean in that, even if you didn't say it. So how much of that can we bring in to enrich your question? And then bring it along to you know, what, what is called prompt engineering, where we can say, well, we, we know what you want, but instead of trying to have the, the LLM uh, answer it natively, we're going to try to understand what kind of thing is best for you. Are you asking for an explanation, a summary, a comparison, help with the UI? and channel it into specific requests, which then can be used to drive, the thing on the right, the tools you have. You know what? Instead of guessing what your biggest position is, I'll just set up a positions table and sort it by size. And you can go look at it. You're not going to get that wrong. And you can see how I did my work, right? Uh, or you know, help me compare changes and spreads. Well, I'll give you a little narrative, which you know may be close to right. But I'll actually draw you a chart of the changes in these spreads so you can go look at further work. And I think this is a really important way to engage expert users because they're difficult, and demanding, and don't trust anyone. Because that's their job, is to be the final, the final word, right? So. This is how we're thinking about it. Uh, as an example from our compliance uh, work, we're, we're putting something together where when those analytics flag a potential, you know, say, bad money laundering operation, I can provide a summary of it and then immediately bring up an interface that says, here's the money movement, here's the geographical linkages, here's the corporate relationships that caused this to be flagged. Now you go look at it. I've got them you know, started without trying to do all their work for them. So th that's how we look at things. When we're building applications like this, these are a lot of the components that are important to us. If you're building applications that are in this space, we, we think we can bring you faster to market. But it's really important that you figure out what all your pieces are, including all the partner technologies you can use, so we can all get to market and the AI panel faster. Thanks.